Thank you, Lord. Yep, no toiling in my mouth, just fish in my nets. Praise God. Praise God. Good to see you this morning. Glad that you're here. Glad you didn't let the weather deter you. I want to uh, pick up on some things that I've uh, been talking about the last several weeks. Of course, last week we had a special guest speaker. The week before that was Easter. We had our early service and changed things up a little bit. But if you'll remember prior to that, I've been sharing with you <clears throat> out of something that the Lord spoke to me a number of weeks ago, maybe months now. He said, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. These are three things that you have to deal with. Three enemies of your faith, three enemies of your spiritual life, three enemies of your prosperity and of your peace and of your victory in any and every area. And the point that he was making to me, and that of course, you know, he tells me these things because he wants me to share them as well as walk in the light of them. But you have to deal with them differently. You don't just deal with everything the same, although there is a lot of overlapping. So we began, we began by talking a little bit about the world and how you have to, in the, the world, and the word world means uh, from the Greek word cosmos, it just is, is, is the world, the, everything that is, the physical uh, you know, realm that we live in, this space-time continuum. And, uh, but it also speaks of the systems of this world. And the systems of this world are the enemy of God. Now, you can't divorce yourself from living in the world. It's not possible. But Jesus said, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. And this is the awareness and the revelation that you have to have, that you can be in the world and even operating in the systems of God, uh, in the systems of the world, such as business and so forth, applying godly principles and walking as believers and succeed anyway even though the world and its systems are not necessarily of God. God shows us how to navigate these things. And yet, at the same time, you have to maintain a certain separation from them. In other words, let, let me put it like this. You, you have to recognize that culture should not influence you greatly. Amen. It's hard not to be influenced by it to some extent. But you, you have to have personal boundaries. And God will help you with those boundaries. He'll, he'll change those boundaries sometimes. He'll tell you to do certain things certain times. And then later on, he may modify that. Amen. And a lot of that is just to help get things under control in your life and bring them under God's control. Because like we've said before in several services here of late, you know, a horse with a rider and a saddle can overtake a free running Mustang out on the, I was watching a TV show the other night that it, they did that very thing. They took after this herd of Mustangs and ran them down. How? Because that horse under control reaches a greater potential than the one who is just seemingly unencumbered. And yet there's, there, there's things God can get out of you and get, get to you and help you with that uh, go beyond what it would seem you could do without any control in your life. And so you have to, you have to recognize that. So there's a certain amount of separation. It's just like, for instance, the, the offering is a perfect example. The world is toiling. The world talks about toiling. Everywhere you go and everything you turn on and all the media and all that is talking about the problems. But if you want fish, you got to leave the toiling. You got to leave that realm of talking, thinking, worrying, you know, trying to adjust because of it. And you got to enter into the system of God. That's one, that's just one area of separation from the world. And like she said, you, you, you know, you, you, you hang around people who are toiling. That's what they're going to be talking about. That's what they're going to be, you know, living in and it will affect you. So that's part of watch your associations. Amen. Amen. Now you're going to associate with people at all levels and, you know, in all, from all walks of life. And you can't, again, you, nobody's suggesting that you try to, you know, hide from that. Just recognize how much of that to let in to your life. 
And again, the Holy Ghost is there to help you. He's there to help you in all these things. The flesh is the second thing we talked about. About how that your flesh and the lust thereof, the Bible says, are, will give you, give you problems. Now, lust has a negative connotation in the English language, but the Greek word simply means desire. And you and I are created with desires. Our flesh has desires. Our heart has desires. Sometimes the two aren't the same thing. Sometimes your flesh wants to do what your inner man knows better than to do. But there's a warfare here. And it kind of reminds me, you've probably seen this in some form or fashion, but I, I think about it in a, a little uh, plaque I saw. I took a picture of it. An, an old Cherokee grandfather was talking to his grandson about his life. And he said, you know, every man has two wolves, you know, a good one and an evil one on the inside. And they are at war with one another. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what life is all about, that warfare between those two wolves. And the grandson said, well, which one wins? And the grandfather said, the one you feed. And so the Bible says the same thing in, in, you know, in different ways. It's what you feed on is what you know, you're going to have a desire for. It's amazing how you can just get addicted to something so easily. You, know, you, can, you can watch something and be drawn into it. Not intending to be drawn into it. You just get a desire for it. You see? And... Um, this is true of anything. Indulging those appetites, sometimes the Holy Ghost will tell you, pull back. Pull back. Stop that. Fast that. We talked Wednesday night about the fruit of self-control and about how fasting is an effective way to get hold of some things. Now, I don't suggest you do like, like some of the supernatural fasts in the Bible and try to fast for 40 days. Fast everything. Matter of fact, that'll get you in trouble, quite frankly. Let's, let's just go ahead and explore that a little bit. L prolonged fasts can be dangerous, all right? Now, fasting is very, uh, right now, it's, it's very, uh, what's the word, chic and uh, popular. Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of doctors, a lot of medical nutritionists and so forth, they are promoting fasting. And uh, the way they do it is it, it, probably all right. It is beneficial. But, uh, you know, sometimes you'll hear about long fast. I remember one time a friend of mine, and he also was a, a pilot, and uh, he and I were going to go somewhere. Well, he would take the first month of uh, the year, January, and he would fast for 30 days. And, uh, I, you know, he never, he didn't ask me about it, so I didn't, I didn't weigh in on it, but I knew that he did it, but I really didn't know how he did it. I didn't know if it was a total fast or, or what, you know, sometimes you can fast certain things. But he'd fast every month of January for 30 days. Well, he and I were going to fly somewhere and we were going to take his airplane. And he asked me a question on the phone about an instrument. He said, now, when do you change this instrument to read such and such? And when he said that, I thought, uh, excuse me, we weren't going to fly together. We were going to meet somewhere. He was going to fly his plane and I was going to meet him out there. And uh, he said, now, now, when is it to cha you change that? And I thought, by the question, I thought, he's not thinking right. There's something off here. And the Lord told me, it's that fast. He's, he, he's, he's gone too deep in it, you know. I mean, he's, he, he's, he's, <laughs> he's suffering from, from nutritional deficit, you know, and it's affected his, his thinking. Because he asked me something that made no sense at all, and it was a rookie kind of a mistake. Not a, not a real highly technical thing, just a real rookie kind of a thing. So I told him, I said, uh, Bud, you, you, uh, you, you, don't need to, you don't need to fly today. You need to let one of your, well, one of your pilots fly you. He said, you think so? I said, yeah, I, I know so. So he did, and uh, everything was fine. Now, later on, I was talking to Charles Capps about it. Charles said, you probably saved his life because it was just, uh, you know, it, it, just, it just wasn't mentally, it wasn't right. Now, there was nothing wrong with his mind, but that fasting, you see what I'm saying? He, he, he was starving himself, so to speak. His brain reacted to it, just thinking. So I don't recommend those kind of fasts. I don't rec recommend long fasts. Neither does the Bible. Amen. You, don't, you don't find Jesus recommending those kind of things. Yet on the other hand, it's a good way to bring things under control. And I don't just mean fasting like food. You need, and I, I'm, I'm going to tell you that I don't usually tell people what to do, but I'm telling you, you need to fast news. You do. You need to fast the news. I guarantee you. I'm, 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 listen, 
I'm telling you, you think if you're, if you're addicted to it, that I got to know what's going on to know how to pray. I'm telling you that if you'll fast the news, you'll know everything you need to know. It'll come to you. I guarantee it. But by fasting it, you're going to break free of some of the worry of it. It's real, real easy to get interested in things that don't really matter. Besides that, it's not news. It's old. There's nothing new about it. It's the same old, same old, just different, different voices behind it and all that. You want news? Read your Bible. That's what's coming. Amen. So I, I recommend that you, that you fast news. Just, you know. I watch the weather in the morning and half the time they, they don't know what they're talking about. Just for today. I mean, I do. I, I look at the weather in the morning. Uh, what's going to happen today? I don't even care about next week right now. Just what today. And sometimes they get it and sometimes they don't. So anyway, that's, that's, that's the extent of my news watching. And yet I'm just as informed, probably more informed than a, a lot of people that feed on it all the time. So, um, yeah, you can fast things like that on the, on the food side. There'll be times the Lord will tell you, lay off that. Just do it. I shared Wednesday night about how the Lord spoke to me and said, lay off your iPad. You're playing that game too much. Well, I mean, there's nothing sinful about playing an iPad game, you know, an app or something like that. And yet at the same time, I realized, you know, yeah, I, I can't go to bed at night until I know I've logged in that day so I don't lose all my points that I've built, you know, this is my 137th consecutive day to get in and I get a reward for it. I need to, I need to lay that, lay all that. Are you here? Amen. Now you, that sounds funny, but then on the other hand, you watch how young people will sit there and, and, and play those things all day long. And see, there's dangers in that. The flesh will pull you into directions that you don't need to be pulled into. Now don't fear it. Because the greater one's in you. Amen. But you deal with that differently than you deal with the world. You can't separate yourself from, your, from the flesh. But the world, the, the, the Bible tells us where the world's concerned, live a separated life. And then the Bible tells us where our flesh is concerned. Paul said, I, I beat my body or I, I bring my body under, into subjection so that when I preach to others, I myself might not be a castaway. He realized that just being a good preacher and just knowing the Bible is not enough. You still got to rein it in, rein those things in. Are you listening? Amen. Now then, that brings us to the third one, the devil. Now, I, I, I got into some of this on Easter, but by virtue of the nature of, the, of an Easter service, we didn't really, you know, it, it, it didn't go exactly like some of the others. We're, we're preaching to the visitors and we're magnifying the resurrection, but at the same time, it's all tied together. So let's explore just a little bit now about the devil and uh, weave it into what we talked about on Easter Sunday. First of all, I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. Because if you remember on Easter Sunday, we magnified or we, we um, um, amplified or we highlighted the gift of righteousness. And I want us to look at a, some scriptures related to that. Isaiah, what did I say, chapter 32? 30. Huh? 30. 30, yeah, Isaiah chapter 32. Now notice what it says in verse 17. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation and in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places. Amen. I like that. Righteousness has an effect, effect, and it has a work. It works peace and it effects quietness and assurance forever. Righteousness. Now remember the Bible tells us that when Jesus paid the price, we now receive the gift of righteousness. Now righteousness, let's, let's, let's boil it down here to the essence. Let's don't be spiritual with this thing. Understand that righteousness simply means you're right 
with God. You are right with God. And there's something so powerful and something, something so profound about being right and knowing it. When you know you're right. I read to you the epitaph on the tombstone of a Texas Ranger named Captain Bill McDonald. And I want to read this again. It says as part of that, the last sentence on that, if you wilt or falter, talking about, well, he was a Texas Ranger and he went after a lot of bad guys. So this is one of his sayings that they put on his tombstone. If you wilt or falter, he will kid you. But if you go straight at him and never give him time to get cover or to think, he will weaken 99 times in 100. No man in the wrong can stand up against a man in the right who keeps on a coming. I like that. No man in the wrong, and that includes the devil, can stand up against a man who is in the right and knows it. I'll add that. Know you're in the right. When you know you're in the right. No man in the wrong, no devil in the wrong can stand up against a believer who knows he's right with God and keeps on coming. Now, there's several ingredients in that. One of them is you got to keep coming. If you quit, well, he wins. But he didn't beat you. You just quit. But it's, it's being right and knowing it. When you know you're right with God, Amen. there's something about that that just, it strengthens you. Yes. It gives you a determination. It eliminates the questions. Here's where a lot of people don't, uh, they, they don't prevail because faith really stops where the question mark is. If you have a question about something, it's hard to have faith in that area. But if you've settled it and know that you're right, about any given thing, Amen. then you can pursue it forever. Amen. There'll be a strength, there'll be a determination there about it. Now, I'm, I mentioned the iPad. I've, uh, I kind of got interested in this in a roundabout way because Facebook, which I don't do, but I'm, I'm a little bit, um, oh, what's the word? I, I don't know, I just, you know, on, on your uh, iPad or your smartphone, you get those little notification badges with little red numbers, you know, if you got a message or if you, okay, I don't like those on my phone. Sometimes I look at people's phones and it's just covered up with red. Every app's got a red on it and telling you to update it or, or telling you you got a message or email or something like that. That just freaks me. I got to tell you, if I see somebody's phone like, as a matter of fact, I've taken people's phones away and said, I'm, I'm going to fix it. I don't like all those red badges, so I clear mine. Amen. I keep it clear. You won't find, you know, for very long, a notification badge on it. You're shaking your head, obviously you're the same way. Is that right? Yeah, you just, okay. You like things to be up to date. Well, I have Facebook, I don't use it. I never post, but I, you get these news feeds. And a, most of them are things and people that I know, but sometimes, you know, there'll be stuff in there that just kind of pops up. Well, I started watching these guys, one guy in particular, who is a First Amendment auditor. Y'all know what a First, First Amendment audit is? All right, I'll tell you, it doesn't matter. Now, don't, don't pursue this, don't, don't, don't go looking at it. Just, just, just let me explain to you. First Amendment auditor is somebody who goes out to a public place, a library, a police station, or whatever, a, you know, a courthouse, a tax assessor's office, They'll go in with a camera. Now, a lot of times there'll be, there'll be um, signs that says no videoing. However, it's not illegal. That's just policy. First Amendment guarantees your right to free speech, to freedom of worship, and to the freedom of the press. And the press, contrary to what somebody, some people think, is not, in other words, there is no organization that gives you press credentials and makes it official. If you decide to be an independent journalist, then you are. 
you got the same right as anybody else. All right, so these auditors go in and they'll video, and most of them are doing it to push a button. Yeah. There's one guy in particular that I like. He does it to educate because he's flexing his rights, standing up for his rights, trying to make it better for everybody else, and yet he still pushes a lot of buttons. Yeah. All right, I got interested in this stuff. And I started watching some, I, I went to the YouTube website, started looking at some of these things, and I, I really enjoy uh, some of the confrontations uh, because he'll go in and, and he'll, uh, uh, you know, be videoing and somebody will say, can I help you? No, no, I'm good. I'm good. Just taking some pictures. Well, you can't do that in here. Uh, you can't? Uh, well, how come? I, I didn't see anything wrong with it. Well, you just can't. Didn't you see that sign? Uh, well, the sign didn't say anything about video. Well, you can't do it. Oh, how come I can't do it the whole time he's doing it? And he'll play, play around with that. And they'll say, well, if you don't, if you don't stop, we're going to call the police. He'll say, well, oh, oh, okay, I don't, I don't know why, but go ahead. So they'll call the police. And anyway, police will come. Sometimes there's a head-on confrontation, you know, and they'll tell him. He'll say, well, what law is that? Well, you just can't do it. Well, well why? What, what law is that? Well, there's private information back there. Yeah, but you can't trespass the eyes. Yeah. And you can't, you can't trespass me from a public place unless I've committed a crime. Right. Right. He's got right on his side. Yeah. Now, a lot of times, ignorant authorities don't know that. Yeah. And these people, these, these authorities, police officers or security or whatever, they may mean well and they may think they're doing their job, but they're wrong. Yeah. And he's right and has the Constitution behind him, and he knows it, and it's amazing sometimes the way that he just keeps on pushing and picking and doesn't surrender and doesn't give up, and they'll threaten to arrest him. Sometimes they'll go hands-on with him, but <laughs> it always turns around because somebody up the food chain with more authority will come down and say, no, he, that's legal. It's kind of like the, you know, the civil rights movement of the 60s. They had the Constitution behind them. Now, culturally, there was a lot of opposition. From the authority standpoint, there was a lot of opposition, but they just kept pushing, Amen. kept pushing, Amen. kept pushing. People whose rights were being violated kept pushing, and what happened? Well, things turned. Amen. Are you here? There's something about being right and knowing you're right and refusing to give up. Now, the reason that I watch some of these things, I learn from them because I'm, I'm, I, I watch these things and it's given me some ideas about how to present this stuff to you. About knowing your rights, knowing that you are right and keep it coming. Amen. Refusing to bow down to threats, to intimidation, to fear, and it's a fearful thing, fearful thing to be surrounded by guys with guns and badges. But you understand this, Satan really thinks he's the God of this world. And he'll intimidate and he'll push and he'll press, but you as a believer are right. You've got right on your side because you are righteous in Christ. And we'll see how the Bible demonstrates some of that here momentarily. But let's, uh, let's keep looking at this. Go with me to another verse of Scripture. Go with me to uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 54. You're there in the 32nd chapter. Isaiah 54. Verse 13. Now this will factor in a little bit later. So pay close attention to verse 13. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Everybody say it out loud. Great shall be the peace of my children. Say this. Great shall be the peace of my grandchildren. Yeah. Verse 14. In righteousness you shall be established. Or let me just say it like this. In being right you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression. Thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Behold, they shall surely gather together. See, just like that illustration I was giving you. They're going to come at you. 
God says, but not by me. I'm not the one that's sending them to oppose you. For you, uh, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Why? Because you're righteous. Verse 16, behold, I have created the smith that blows the coals in the fire and that brings forth an instrument for his work. I have created the waster to destroy, but no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And the last clause, last phrase says, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Notice your righteousness is his righteousness. It's not your righteousness. It's his righteousness that has been conferred upon you. Now we use the word righteousness so glibly sometimes and flippantly and we, I'm righteous, praise the Lord, righteousness of God in Christ. And yet we don't stop to think about what that means. It means that you're right. Amen. And once again, we come back over to that, that epitaph. Nothing can stop a man who knows he's in the right and keeps on coming. Amen. They will try to stop you. They will try to intimidate. They will try to terrorize. Now, I don't recommend you go out and become a First Amendment auditor. You understand what I'm saying? I'm talking about applying this thing in the spiritual areas of your life, particularly where the devil's concerned, overcoming the devil. Although, I will say this, I respect what some of them are doing. Some of them are just obnoxious. They just want a, they want a confrontation. But I respect those that are pushing back against those that would take rights away from us as Americans. Are you listening to me? Amen. I don't plan to be one, but right on the other hand, you know, <laughs> things don't always go like you plan. Anyway, <clears throat> anyway, anyway, our righteousness is God's righteousness. He has made us right. Now, Romans chapter one, turn there and you're about to look at it. What is it, verse 17? Are we putting them on the screen? Romans 1, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Uh, back up. Back up one. There it is. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So here we see that the life of faith, living by faith, living in faith, is all predicated on the righteousness of God revealed to you. When your righteousness becomes revelation to you, now then faith becomes possible and nothing becomes impossible. Praise God. And so we see here the, the importance, and, and once again, this was the point I was making on Easter, that of all the things that, that after all Jesus went through and all that he suffered, for it to be for him to confer righteousness upon us and then raise from the dead, once again, with righteousness for his people, it always, it's remarkable to me that when Jesus rose from the dead, it seems to me, just thinking naturally, that would have been an ideal time to set some things right. In other words, ride that donkey back into Jerusalem again, this time with the nail prints in your hands. Or better yet, ride three feet above the donkey. A lot of things you could do. You could have walked up to Herod's door and knocked on it. Remember me? You could, he, he, there's so many things he could do. Now he appeared to people, he wasn't, he wasn't shy, he didn't, he didn't hide, but right on the other hand, he didn't go in and display himself except to those that were his followers and disciples. Why? Because Jesus had just spent three years showing what a man who is right with God can do where the devil's concerned and he wanted you and me to live that same kind of life before 
we go to the ultimate reward. And yet, if we don't know it, it's, the, it's about the same as not having it. If you don't know you're right, it really doesn't differ a whole lot from not being right. And it was man's unrighteousness that gave Satan his dominion over him and allowed him to lord it over him for all those centuries. All right, now, talking about Jesus ministry. Let, let's look at some things here. Lead, lead up to this. Go with me first of all to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Real quickly, let's look at a few scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now note this. We walk in the flesh, but we don't war after the flesh. The implication there is that we war. There's a war going on. And then it's explicitly stated in the next verse, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So we can establish on the basis of this verse, we are at war. There is a war going on. However, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not natural, they're not physical, because our warfare is not a physical warfare. We're not battling, we're not at war with our flesh or with anybody's flesh. Even what's going on in, in the world today, you can take the war that's going on, Russia and Ukraine, it's a physical warfare, but what's behind it? That's what, that's what we, we as believers understand. It, it, this, this didn't happen because of flesh. Amen. Spirits are at work. Territorial spirits are at work. As, as believers, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Now go with me to the book of um, Ephesians chapter 6. These things you know, I, I know that, but we need to look at them. Yes, Ephesians the 6th chapter. Verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, there are four different classes of spirits there. The first one, principalities, is from the Greek word where we get the word prince. He's talking here about literal beings, all right? Spirit beings. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Now look at this, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, if you think that righteousness does not factor in majorly here, stop and consider the purpose of a breastplate. The breastplate is that which protects the vital organs. Amen. You can lose a hand and keep fighting, but you can't lose what's in here. Are you here? Amen. 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 You can drop your sword and, 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 and live to fight another day, but you've got to protect what's in here. Amen. And so the Bible says that righteousness is our breastplate. It's protecting the vital organ. It's protecting the heart and the lungs and the, the kidneys and the guts and all those little things that are packed tight together down in there. That's crucial. Righteousness. It's a defensive thing. It repels. And, and the breastplate of the Roman soldiers back in those days, I mean, it was, it, it was, it was tough. It was a tough thing. It was designed to deflect swords and spears and whatnot. If any of y'all ever saw, you know, Clint Eastwood in uh, um, A Fistful of Dollars. You remember the big shootout at the end with the guy with the rifle? He put on that steel breastplate because that other guy, the, the bad guy, he had a creed, always shoot for the heart. And he was good with a rifle. Clint Eastwood came walking in and had that steel breastplate on under his poncho. The guy started shooting at him, boom, and it knocked him back. But then he got up, boom, and knocked him back again. And he taunted him. He said, shoot for the heart. Remember, shoot for the heart. Keep shooting for the heart. 
He's taunting the guy, and the guy keeps shooting at him, and he finally empties his gun. And Clint Eastwood takes the poncho off, and there's that, there's that steel breastplate there. And he drops it to the ground. Bullet dents in it, right around the heart, but didn't get to his heart. Saved his life. Are you listening? You got one of those. You're wearing one of those. Don't take it off. Keep it on. Wear it, glory to God. Because the devil can't shoot through it. Praise God. Can't shoot through it. Isn't that right, Francis? Here's our Westerns expert over here. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Breastplate of righteousness. That's no, there's no coincidence that it factors in as such an important piece of the equipment. Then he goes on to talk about your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. All these things are important. Don't get me wrong. But that breastplate, there's something about That's crucial. And that's what Jesus rose again to confer upon you. That's what he suffered for, to make you right with God. And remember, nothing can stop a man who knows he's in the right and keeps on coming. You're right. And you got rights in this world. A lot of people are quick to stand up for their constitutional rights and nothing wrong with that. But more important than that is stand for your spiritual rights. Stand for your spiritual rights. Don't cave where your spiritual rights are concerned. Glory to God. Now, let's go look at, at Jesus in action. Go with me to uh, Mark's, Mark's Gospel, the fifth chapter. And we'll move quickly here, but there's some important, very important points. Some of them perhaps you've never heard made. Verse 1. They came over the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. Remember, the devil tried to stop him on the sea with that storm, that demonic storm. Didn't work. So now then he comes over to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, Neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Now, just as a footnote here, if you look at Matthew's account, the eighth chapter of Matthew, he gives a parallel account of this story. And the demon said something that was interesting. He said, have you come to torment me before the time? Before the time. Mark omits that, but Matthew brings it out. Have you come to torment me before the time? I'll come back to that in a little bit. Verse 8. For he said unto him, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. How many? We'll see in just a moment. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now, there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000, that's a lot, and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they that saw it told him how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Jesus uh, Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee, and has had compassion on thee. And so he departed, and he began to publish these things that Jesus had done for him. And so what we see here is that an interesting story about how that, how that uh, Jesus dealt with a devil. Now remember, the world, the flesh, the devil. Here's how you have to deal with the devil, all right? Now, first of all, we see that there were a lot of devils involved here. And once again, we see the territorial proclivity that they seem to have. There, there, there are, are, are certain geographic areas that, these, that, that various uh, 
spiritual powers and demon spirits seem to have an affinity for or seem to, to, to uh, gravitate toward. And uh, this was the case. They didn't want to leave this region. They didn't want, to, they didn't want to, to be sent away, so to speak. Now, he's over across the Sea of Galilee, which is the Lake of Gennesaret, same thing, freshwater lake. He's over on the other side in, an, in a Greek area. This is not Jewish. This has a, a Greek Hellenistic um, uh, you know, influence here, hence the swine. Swine, pigs are unclean animals. You're not going to find the Jews raising pigs. And so if they wanted sausage, they had to go to the other side of the sea. And they didn't want sausage. And, and so anyway, this is why the swine are over there. Well, the, the, the man in whom this spirit was is it's very interesting uh, because these demons show us something. They, they uh, and by the way, uh, the, um, uh, let's see, what verse was it? Verse 12, all the devils besought him. Now, when we say devil, when I say devil, I'm talking in this sense. There is a devil. His name is Lucifer. He was a fallen angel. Other angels fell with him. This word devil here is, is uh, the Greek word demon. And this is where we get our English word demons, all right? So these were demons that were inhabiting this man. But when they came to Jesus, they announced some things that were not known at that time. For instance, Jesus' deity. This was early in Jesus' ministry, and nobody knew that Jesus was the Son of God, except for John the Baptist, perhaps, God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, and Jesus. Nobody else knew it nor understood what that meant, all right? And so... so the devils, though, they recognized this. They announced Jesus' deity. What have we to do with the Jesus, thou son of the most high God? They also recognized that they knew the future. They knew what their fate was. Have you come to torment us before the time? And they also recognized that Jesus had the say-so here. Amen. They knew it. That's pretty cool. So what that tells us is, that these creatures, these demons, they have intelligence and they have personalities. In other words, this is not an idiom for psychiatric disorder. Today, a lot of people don't recognize the existence of demons and they try to treat everything psychiatrically or medically. And yet we see that these are actual spirit beings probably disembodied spirit beings. The difference between angels and demons, angels were created by God, fell from heaven. A third of the angels went with Satan, went with Lucifer when he fell. But there are other created beings here as well. And perhaps these were pre-Adamite disembodied spirits. Perhaps these were post-Adamite disembodied spirits. That those that died at the flood, I don't know, not humans but other things that, that may have inhabited the earth at the time. And so we don't know. We don't know. But the indication is that they, they're not angels. The point is they differ from angels in several important characteristics. Angels, generally, when they appear, they appear as humans. They have the ability to appear. They can interact with humans directly. They're able to wage war and enter into combat. You remember um, uh, Jacob wrestled with an angel and they, they were grappling physically and he wouldn't let him go until he blessed him and he got what he wanted from him. Amen. And of course, angels are given credit for destroying in one case, 185,000 Syrian troops. And so they're able to wage war in combat like this. And when they appear, they appear as humans for the most part, as far as I know exclusively, uh, uh, you know, from a scriptural standpoint, for instance, the Bible says many have entertained angels unaware. Yeah. Amen. Well, I mean, if it was something with wings, you'd be aware. Yeah. <laughs> but if an angel, I, I, I've had encounters that I look back on, and I, I wonder, I bet that was an angel. Amen. I was in Spain one time, Phyllis and I, and Mark and Janet Brzee. We flew into um, Madrid and took off in a rented car to the east, headed to Barcelona and then up the, up the coastline, Mediterranean coast. And we were driving around, we came into the city, I believe it was Verona. 
And uh, no, no, that wouldn't be it. Um, anyway, um, uh, uh, oh, what, what's the name of that city where the big temple was? Uh, the, I mean, the big uh, synagogue, the Catholic, Catholic uh, church. Uh, starts with a P. Anyway, we're, dri we're, we're driving across Spain. We're, nobody speaks Spanish. We're over there. We get into this area and we're looking for somebody. And a guy pulls up beside us in a car. And I'm sitting in the passenger seat. I think Mark's driving. I'm sitting in the passenger seat. Windows down. The guy pulls up beside us. And he says, y'all need something in English. You need something? You looking for somebody? Yeah, we're looking for. And I forget how we could, you know, if we knew his name. I, I've kind of forgotten the, some of the details. But I, we told him. We were looking for somebody, a minister, speaks English, et cetera, and so on. He said, follow me. So we followed him, and he took us to the guy's house. The father of Lydia Ames, who is the wife of Jim Ames, who pastors in Dodge City, Kansas. And I, I met him there. And, and he opened his house up and entertained us and all that. And English, and, you know, I mean, here we are, strangers in Spain. Well, the guy that led us there, he, he just... We looked around, he's gone. The car's gone. Yeah. And we're scratching our head. That was weird. <laughs> but it sure was a blessing. Amen. So, you know, they, they appear. Angels appear and we, we can entertain them and not know it. All right? Demons, on the other hand, you don't find appearances of demons in the Bible. What you find are manifestations of them. And all that we know about demons as far as the way they look is what somebody's imagination gives us. Now, the only way you're going to see them is if the gift of discerning of spirits is in operation as a believer. That's one of the nine spiritual gifts. So if the discerning of spirits you see into the spirit realm, you can see them then. But demons cannot appear and disappear at will. Something we see about this is they need a person to inhabit. Yeah. They need a body to inhabit. So we know this. They're different from fallen angels. Demons are. They are under Satan's control. Matter of fact, they're one of his greatest resources. And they are malevolent and dangerous. Also, we know this, that if you're not a Christian, you're vulnerable to them. Now, it's interesting to note that in this story, they could not indwell even the animals without permission. How about that? They're dangerous, but they're not omnipotent. And so they couldn't even go into these animals. Now, this is, you know, controversial in some commentaries. Why did Jesus let them go into the pigs? Why did he send them into the pigs instead of something else? Perhaps it was this. Perhaps it was to illustrate to us that this was not a psychiatric problem. Because when he cast, when he allowed, they, they, they said, let us have the pigs. When he allowed that, and then the pigs became self-destructive and ran down the, into, into the water. We see here now that that was not just some medical problem that the guy had. Now here's the thing. The Gadarene is gone. The disciples are gone. Jesus is gone. The pigs are gone. But the demons are still there. And they still look for something to inhabit. And quite honestly, there's probably more of them over there than there are here in the United States. Because that's where the doors was op were opened. And there's more in the end time scenario to play out in the Middle East than there is in America. So that's why you've got so much going on. Here's a question. What does the West Bank, Gaza, and Hebron, Jericho have in common? All of these areas and several other cities beside, if you remember, look back on our study of Joshua, these were areas that uh, Joshua was told to go in and destroy every living thing and didn't quite get the job done. He was to go in and kill every man, every woman, and every child. Now that to a 21st century American, you know, and we're all lovey-dovey, that seems strange, seems bizarre, but there's a purpose in it. Those are still the areas 
in the, the, the Middle Eastern world that are under contest, yeah. Yeah. That, are, that are being struggled over. Yeah. Israel right there in the middle of them, and they still are opposed in Jericho, Gaza, the West Bank. Matter of fact, Jericho uh, is, the, is the, the, the ground zero, the headquarters of the PLO. Why? Because the weapons of our, I mean, the, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. See, these things that are going on even internationally, there's, there's demons behind it. The devil is behind it. His, his plan. He's got a strategy. He's going to fail, but it doesn't change the fact that he's a dangerous and formidable opponent. Amen. And so we see here that Jesus had absolute control, absolute authority over these demon spirits. Can you say amen? amen? Something we know about demons, we understand from this, is that they are powerless without a host body. Powerless. They can't find something to inhabit, they're powerless. We also recognize that when they have a host body, that supernatural strength many times shows up. And you see that today. You know, a lot of people who are involved in things that they shouldn't be involved in, and this kind of speaks to what we're about to talk about, points of entry. There are ways that a person can open himself up to demons. Yeah. And they're not psychiatric problems that the person has. And you see a lot of things going on in the, uh, in the, in the well, just take anything, for example, the drug world. A yeah, yeah. lot of supernatural things have a supernatural strength and, and, and you know, the, but the thing about it is when you're, when you're partaking of this kind of power as a result of a demon, it is self-destructive. Yes. It, 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 it destroys the human body. Amen. These demons have personalities and when a person opens himself up to one, they'll take on the personalities of these demonic spirits. Amen. Amen. But, once again, they require permission. Yeah. They can't just do what they want to do. So that's why these points of entry, certain kinds of practices are dangerous. Because they will open the door, in a sense. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 8 says, Whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent will bite him. Remember the story of Job, how that Satan recognized it. You've got a hedge around Job. And that hedge had to come down before Satan could even mess with him. Amen. And God didn't take the hedge down. And God doesn't take the hedge down today. You are right. That breastplate is a hedge. That righteousness is a hedge. He can't take it down. God won't take it down. Only you can breach it. And generally, if it is breached, it's just through ignorance. Just through not realizing what we're doing. A good illustration of, of, of what I'm talking about, practices and so forth, is found in um, the, the old movie from a generation or two ago, The Exorcist. Did y'all see The Exorcist when it came out or ever seen it? Yeah, I watched it when it came out. Creeped me out. I wasn't a believer at the time. You know, I didn't know anything about the Word. So I just went to the movies. Yeah. And uh, man, this, this thing. But The Exorcist was actually based on a true story. In the true story, it was a boy, not a girl. But the way that he opened himself up to these things was through playing with a Ouija board. Wow. Now see, a lot of times Christians get the, 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 the evil eye from the world because we put the brakes on Halloween. Yeah. Halloween in some parts of the world is a very dangerous holiday. Yes, yes, Maybe not so much here where everybody's just going trick or treat from door to door, but nonetheless, Things like this can be a point of entry where demons can get involved, if you will. And there are different degrees of demon uh, uh, influence and control in a person's life. It doesn't always wind up like this. But the point is, who wants any of it? I did a series many years ago called Spiritual Parasites. That's what a demon is. It's a spiritual parasite. I mean, who wants just a few worms in their stomach? Huh? Huh? You don't have to be eaten up by them. Let's just have a few. Yeah. Just maybe one tapeworm. 
No. Then why any demonic influence? See? And just like, just like natural parasites, they got to have a way in. You know? Uh, drinking the wrong kind of water. <laughs> I went to, uh, I won't mention his name, but uh, I went with another preacher one time on a hunt. We went up way up north, north to Alaska, beyond Alaska, up the Yukon. <laughs> and they told us, don't drink the water if it's still. We're drinking water, and you know, you can boil it and purify it and all that, but they said, be sure if you drink out of the creek. Now, the, the, it looks so pure and clean. We're way up north. I mean, we're open, hours away from any civilization. Beautiful water, but drink running water. Don't drink any still water. Well, he made the mistake of drinking the wrong kind of water. He got a parasite. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, that boy, he suffered. I mean, he, he said, look, I got to tell you, by the time you think I need to get up and go to the bathroom, it's too late. <laughs> he just, he just, he, and he suffered with it for weeks. Finally went to the doctor and they, just, the, they uh, you know, diagnosed him as having a parasite and he got rid of it and then it came back again. It didn't quite kill it off. Well, I don't want any of that. I don't know about you. A little bit of that is not okay with me. We sing a song, just one dose of the Holy Ghost is not enough for me. Just one dose of the demon power is too much for me. Are you here? So, so, so we, we see here that these spiritual parasites, that, 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 that mm -mm, we, don't, we don't want any part of that. Other occult practices, role playing games, seances, any kind of false worship, any of that. Is, is, is dangerous. And we need, to, we need to teach our young people about it, teach our children, teach our grandchildren about it. I, I personally think, I know it's cultural, and I get it, I get the, the pressure and all that, but I think it's a dangerous thing for these kids to have their, their faces in these games, in these eye devices all the time. Praise the Lord. Now then they've got these, actually they've got these virtual worlds. You can put on goggles and go into a different world, a different planet and, and, and play stuff like that. Now, I've never done it. I have done uh, a game where I was fighting a guy in a, with a virtual goggle on and I nearly fell out the window. I was, I was over it. Uh, Erica Michael's house, you know, where, and the guy's throwing punches at me and you get into it. And uh, I, I, was, I was trying to use some of my karate moves and I forgot where I was because you're in this virtual world. And the next thing I knew, I hit the window and the blinds came down and all that kind of stuff. So I had to come back to reality. They've, they've got, they've, huh? You got it on video. For only ten dollars, you can have a copy of this video. But uh, yeah, it's uh, you, you get lost in that stuff. You lose your sense of, of reality if you don't watch it, and if you live in it, well, even more so. But okay, let's close with this. Go with me to the Book of Acts, Acts chapter nineteen. We've magnified the devil enough. Let's now magnify the victory. Acts chapter nineteen, verse. 11 says, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from his body were brought under the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. Amen. Look at that. The evil spirits, just handkerchiefs yeah. saturated with the anointing of God Hallelujah. more than an evil spirit can stand. Amen. That gives us hope, doesn't it? Amen. That's encouraging, isn't it? Amen. That the devil, for all the havoc he may wreak in a person's life, all the trouble he may cause your kids, all the, all, the, all the pain and suffering that he may leave in his wake. Isn't it good to know that even a cloth with the anointing of God in it is too much for a demon spirit Amen. to resist. Amen. Verse 13, then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches, 
And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled, fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus and fear fell on all them that were, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. And look at verse 19. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Now, notice how when these people came to the Lord, automatically they knew that those books and those occult practices that they were involved in, they knew this is the open door and we're going to, they didn't sell it because then you'd be selling trouble to somebody else. They burned it. Boy, I bet you God blessed them for it, don't you? Amen. That they'd take something that they could make money on and yet because they knew it was dangerous, they refused to spring it on some unsuspecting person. They burned it. Uh, I bet there was a harvest. I bet that was a seed in God's sight and there was a harvest in that. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. But here's the point. There are things that have to be renounced. There are things that have to be distanced. You have to distance yourself from. And as believers, we should never even play close to them. To give them no place in our life. Amen. But the good news is, we have power over the devil because we're right. Amen. We're right. Hallelujah. And I love that phrase. Jesus I know, and Paul I know. Amen. But who are you? Amen. Notice how he put Paul in the same category as Jesus. Amen. Now we laugh about the guys being powerless, but let's think about Paul. Yeah. It'd be something if he said, yeah, Jesus, I know, but who are you? But he didn't. He put Paul in that same class. Why? Because Paul had God's righteousness. Yeah. Yeah. Paul's righteousness is of me, yeah. saith the Lord. Amen. And he's got the same sway and the same say-so where the devil is concerned that Jesus had. And Jesus showed us how to handle him. Jesus showed us he can't do anything without my permission. Amen. So what I want to do is, Mark, I don't want to ever inadvertently give him permission right. to do anything in my life. Right. And secondly, when I recognize him, I want to take my position of being right and saying no. Right. You're not going to crowd me and you're not going to crowd my kids Amen. and you're not going to crowd my dogs Amen. and you're not going to crowd my stuff right. and you're not going to crowd anything that I'm a part of. Amen. I don't do what you say, you do what I say. Yeah. Now some people that don't understand the power of confession think you can tell God what to do. God doesn't need to be told what to do, but the devil does. Amen. He's the one that you order around. Amen. And when the Lord exposes him to you, when you see it, take your place. Yes. You. Take your place. Don't let your kids run crazy. Don't let things just go like they are. Amen. Take your stand. Exercise your rights. Flex your righteousness rights. And say, you're not going to run loose in my business. Amen. You have no place here. You're stopping now. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You know what the devil will say? Jesus I know. And I know you. Okay, I give up. Amen. He'll come back again later and try to do it again. So you've got to always be vigilant. Amen. But this is how you handle the devil. Jesus showed us how. The devil can't do, I'm talking about demon spirit. They can't do anything without permission. And if you know their game and you understand this and you've got the Holy Ghost, then you never need to give permission inadvertently, accidentally, or any other kind of way. Can you say Amen. All right, let's stand up and thank God for his righteousness today.